hand over now to uh, our second guest speaker, who's actually a, a friend, a uh, member of the Pattern community, uh, a family member who's coming back to join us, one of our alumni, Hanoi. And I'm not going to say any more, I'm just going to say Hanoi. Over to Hanoi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so it feels really, really great to be back. And today, I'm going to be talking about transcultural technologies, a story of coconuts and artificial intelligence. Transcultural technologies is a vision that I have that has culminated from, let's say, an ongoing journey that I've had through subjects that I've studied, such as physics, music, and electrical engineering to other th fields of knowledge that I've been exposed to, such as traditional woodworking, and political philosophy, and machine learning, and traditional textiles. And today, what I'll be really trying to get us to think about is what does it mean to be global citizens in the age of artificial intelligence? But before we get there, we have to first start with the beginning of the journey. And that journey starts right here in Bangkok, Thailand. This is a map of metropolitan Bangkok. For those of you who are new to Bangkok, let me give you some landmarks to locate yourselves. So arguably the most important part is the airport, which is located right there. And the second most important landmark, which I think we can all agree on, is arguably uh, Siam Paragon, which is located right there. <laughs> and I grew up, uh, I was born and raised here in Bangkok, and I grew up right there in southeast Bangkok near the border with Sumut Rakan, and um, as you can see, it's actually a stone throws away from uh, Bangkok Patina, which is located right there. Um, so I graduated here in 2011, and afterwards I had the opportunity to go study in the U.S. Uh, in, on scholarship at Yale University, where I graduated with a dual degree, one in applied physics and the other one in music. So that was up until 2015, and then afterwards, to be quite frank, as a a little bit burnt out from all that study because doing double majors is like really, really hard work. And so at that time, I actually really wanted to come back home and sort of take some time off and let these things that I've learned in college kind of sink in. And it sort of became a gap year, well, kind of, because I was also, I also had this really exciting fellowship from Yale that allowed me to travel to rural areas to study those regions from a variety of perspectives. That was the goal of the fellowship. And it was actually during this time off between undergrad and graduate school that a lot of the things that I had learned from high school to undergrad began to coalesce with the things that I was learning back home here in Thailand through the fellowship and also just hanging out with my mom and dad. So, what was I doing in Thailand during that time? So, I play the uh, traditional instrument called the Sa U, which is the instrument that you see on the bottom left here. And I actually started picking that up here at Bangkok Padana with Gong in the Thai Instrumental Music Program here. Up on the top left, you see a closely related musical instrument called the Sala, which is its northern cousin from the north of Thailand. And so what I did during this fellowship back in Thailand was actually went and studied how to make these musical instruments. And I apprenticed with a luthier in the north of Thailand. This man right there that you see, his name is Lungke Thai Kam, or Uncle Ke, as I called him. And his workshop is located in Payao province in the north of Thailand. Some of you might be familiar with Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai. Uh, Payao is located about an hour and 30 minutes on bus from these two places. And Lungke's workshop is located in a little village called Metai, which is about 30 minutes north of um, Payao. So every morning, I would get my bike and get on the Song Tao, which is some of you already know and will discover is our modified pickup taxi truck system, very unique to Thailand. And um, I would travel uh, from Payao, which is also my mom's hometown, and I would be dropped off right here. And I would cycle into the village for another about 20 minutes until I reach Uncle Gid's house, like this. And it was in the back of the house that we find his workshop. And this is where all the magic happens. It is here that 
as I was apprenticing with Uncle Kid, I learned how to use the carpenter's lathe. I learned how to chisel pieces of wood using hammers and chisels. I learned how to chop coconuts in half and husk coconuts and tie them together and make sure that the seal between the wood and the coconut is all airtight and perfect. And how to brush coconuts so that they're nice, smooth, and shiny. And yes, that is right. What you see is a refrigerator motor, refrigerator motor that has been bolted to a pair of sandals, which has in turn been bolted to a large log. And that's basically the sanding machine that we were using. I can only imagine how, I don't know, Mr. Mick Smith would be pulling his hair out if this was located in our secondary DT labs and available for students to use. Um, so as I was learning how to make the Salah with Dongke, I became very, very interested in how other musical instruments are made because there are a lot of very similar instruments that look like the Sa'u and the Salah from other countries in Southeast Asia. So I had the opportunity to travel to South Korea and meet Mr. Ru Cheong So, who showed me how the traditional Korean hegum is produced, which is a little different because they actually use some very, very special lacquers to allow their instruments to have a very distinct and unique sound from Thai instruments. And then I also had a chance to meet Mr. Su Chua from Hanoi, Vietnam, where he showed me all the different snake skins and lizard skins that he uses to make the Vietnamese Dan Ho. And through these interactions with these luthiers, learning about how they change raw materials and transform them into beautiful musical instruments, and learning about the knowledge and almost these physical knowledge that they have ingrained in their body, I began to see some patterns. In fact, it turns out that all traditional fiddles from East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, all the way to the Middle East, actually has a common mechanical structure. There's a common DNA found in all these musical instruments. And that was when the physics and the mechanical engineering side of me started to tickle. And so I thought, well, is there a way we can actually redesign this instrument completely? Is there a way that instead of these dis disparate instruments, each, you know, just an individual instrument in their own country, what if we could redesign them to enable the instruments to flow and modularize and allow you to change between multiple instruments fluidly? So I began to sketch some designs where you could take the instrument and disassemble it, which is something that is not possible using traditional um, woodworking methods. The entire instrument is permanently bonded together. And then I began to model how I would put this instrument together in a way that would enable every single component to be easily taken apart and put back together again. And this project finally culminated in something that I call Fiddler. Fiddler is a modular fiddle system that enables you to dis easily disassemble any part of the musical instrument, such as the resonator, and be able to change it with any other resonator from any other country, allowing you to customize the sound, the sonic qualities of the instrument, much like changing lenses on a camera. So, let's check out a video of uh, Fiddler in action. heard there was the Sa'u using a coconut resonator with a cow skin front. And you probably can't see, but uh, that, that's me playing and changing the instrument. So here I'm taking out the resonator and swapping it with the snake skin hexagonal resonator from China. This is the Erhu. Some of you may have seen this musical instrument before. Here I've swapped it with strings found from the Vietnamese Dan Ho instrument. And I put it back together, and within about a minute, I have a new musical instrument that's a mix of all these different fiddles from different musical cultures into one new hybrid musical instrument.
So Fiddler is compatible with existing traditional resonators and materials that are found um, used by the luthiers that I've met. But I was also very interested to look into the future of these musical instruments. How can we leverage new technologies like 3D printing and 3D modeling to reimagine these musical instruments for the future? And so this, the system that I developed is also compatible with 3D printed resonators. And here you see a design that's completely impossible to do using traditional woodworking, but is possible using some of the recent advances in 3D printing. A lot of this work was actually printed here uh, in the DT studio in Bakhmatana. And so what you hear now is the sound from the 3D printed resonator. So once um, so this project had a lot of positive responses, both from young students and from teachers and institutions of music and um, students and teachers that I met at maker fairs in northern Thailand and also here in Bangkok. And a lot of people asked me, are you going to put this in Kickstarter? And I was like, maybe. And I said maybe because Fiddler is not really an end-all and be-all project. In fact, Fiddler is not is the beginning of a much larger vision of technology that I had, and it was through working with the luthiers, it was through working with musicians from the north of Thailand, it was through me trying to integrate all the things that I had learned in my physics and music background with this new um, traditional woodworking, and trying to integrate those things together, that I began to see a much larger picture. And this was something that I used to call, uh, about a year ago, culture-aware technology a convergence of future and traditional technologies engineered and designed for cross-cultural fluidity. Why this insistence on cross-cultural and why this insistence on traditional technologies? Well, I began to notice that when new technologies are introduced, traditional cultures often have a lot of difficulty catching up. Let's look at the world of musical instruments. The way that we make traditional fiddles in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, and Cambodia hasn't changed for the last 300 years. But you look at things like the guitar or the violin, and there's electric guitars, there's carbon fiber guitars, there's new uh, technologies introduced to Western instruments. And as I worked on this project, I began to realize that this pattern is actually not just limited to musical instruments, but it actually permeates all technological development. And I began to realize that technology is always created within the cultural context of its inventors. And the next video, um, illustrates this very nicely. It talks about how some of these patterns reveal themselves in the design of camera films. This is a Shirley card. And if you developed color film between the 1940s and the 1990s, the accuracy of the colors in your photos were pretty much based on this skin tone. Shirley was probably the name of the first person who was pictured on the card and Shirley became the subsequent name of all the women pictured on the card. That's Lorna Roth, a professor and researcher at Concordia University in Montreal. Usually they were white women who wore very colorful dresses. Color film works like this. There are layers of chemicals stacked on each other that are sensitive to different colors of lights. And there are a series of different types of chemical solutions that are used to develop them once exposed to that light. A combination of all of these chemicals creates a film's color balance. And for many decades, chemicals that would bring out various reddish, yellow, and brown tones were largely left out. The consumer market that was designated in the design of film chemistry was that of the lighter skinned market. So when it came to defining what an idealized international skin tone would be, it turned out to be a lighter skin tone than a darker skin tone. If you're shooting people with lighter skins, it looks good. If you're shooting people with darker skins, it doesn't look so good. If you're shooting mixed race in the same screen, then we see the real problems. It wasn't until the 1970s where things started to change, and it came from a very unlikely source. Companies that were advertising different kinds of wood furniture were complaining that Kodak film did not render the difference between dark grain wood and light grain wood. The other companies that Kodak responded to were chocolate makers, because the film couldn't render the difference between dark chocolate and milk chocolate. 
As the film and television industries became more diverse, color balance issues at the professional level became even more apparent. And in the 1990s, a team of designers at Philips and Breda Holland tackled the issue head on by developing a camera system that used two different computer chips to balance lighter and darker skin tones individually. First people to buy these cameras for television, they were called the LDK series, were Oprah Winfrey and Black Entertainment Television, the people who were very aware of these issues. It was around this time that the white Shirley card was joined by the black Shirley card and the Latino Shirley card and the multiracial Shirley card. And Kodak's Gold Max marketing campaign emphasized their film's improved dynamic range. One of the things that they said about Gold Max is that Gold Max is a fine film that can photograph a dark horse in low light. If you were his parents, would you trust this moment to anything other than Kodak Gold film? No other film in the world gives you truer color than Kodak Gold. Today, color film and digital camera sensors have a much broader dynamic range, but the default towards lighter skin and technology still lingers. One of the big mistakes emerged in 2009. I'm sure you heard about it. My coworker Wanda and I are sitting in front of an HP Media Smart computer. It's supposed to follow me as I move. I'm black. I think my blackness is interfering with the computer's ability to, to follow me. So she moved this way, and the camera followed her. And then he'd get into the screen and it would be completely stable. No face recognition anymore, buddy. <laughs> All right, so no pun intended, but I think you get the picture there. Uh, so the takeaway point from that video is this act of what's called technological optimization. So the engineers at Kodak developing that film they weren't being racist, they were performing an engineering optimization. But one of the things that I've learned is that the act of technological optimization fundamentally means that you leave certain demographics in and you keep certain demographics out. And so the whole purpose of Fiddler and the new vision of technology that I had from working on this project was to directly challenge this notion. What if we design technology, we design software and hardware such that every step of the design, engineering, and optimization process, we engineered it to embrace cultural plurality. At every step of the design process, we take into account all these multiple different cultures that are out there and to design the technology to embrace all of those. And it was really exciting to see Fiddler perform very, very well on the international stage. So Fiddler, um, very recently uh, won a silver award in the prestigious A-Star design competition, placing in the top 5% of submitted designs, and also uh, won student runner-up in the Core 77 Design Awards uh, based in the United States. In addition to that, Fiddler is also scheduled, a uh, print of the system is scheduled to be uh, on exhibition at the Musical Instruments Museum in Phoenix, Arizona at the end of this month. And to get all these positive responses on top of the local craftsmen on top of students and teachers and musicians I had met was really, really exciting to get these positive reinforcements on this vision that I had on designing technologies in this particular way. And so with that excitement, and uh, I packed my bags and got ready to go to grad school in the United States. And I was very interested in taking this idea that I had about technology that had been incubated in this very small, isolated field of coconuts and musical instruments, but to transplant that into a much larger field of technology. And I had my eyes set on artificial intelligence and robotics. And for that reason, um, I chose to work with Dr. Gil Weinberg at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm a graduate research assistant there in the robotic musicianship group. And to give you a sense of what I do in a day, here's a little video of a robot that I work with on a daily basis.
And you'll see that Shimon has the ability to groove with the music. <laughs> Dr. Mason Brenton, who just graduated from the program, and is also on my uh, master's thesis committee. That's him right there. All right, so that's Shimo forearm improvising musical robot and a lot of the reason that Shimon is able to do what he does is thanks to recent advancements in a field called <coughs> deep learning so some of you might have heard about you know all these magical things that are happening in artificial intelligence right now. So deep learning is a subfield of a discipline of study called machine learning, which in turn is a subfield of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is not a new thing. It's actually been here since the 1950s. And the reason that we've been hearing it again is because the new wave of artificial intelligence has come back. Artificial intelligence has actually come in waves. There was the first wave, and then the winter, and then a second wave, and then another AI winter, and then the third wave, and then another winter. And we are now sort of in the fourth wave of artificial intelligence, in which each of the waves are characterized by different engineering methods. The current one that we're living in today, this current wave of AI, is dominated by uh, what's called machine learning and deep learning. And it is through these technological breakthroughs that we were able to, for example, defeat the world champion in the game of Go, which was something that academics and industry never thought would possibly happen in the next, uh, until 10 years or 20 years from now, because the number of possible moves in Go is exponentially, exponentially higher than the number of possible moves in chess. Deep learning is also the reason why that autonomous vehicles are slowly becoming a reality and already roaming the streets of San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And the reason that these deep learning systems work is that instead of coming up with handcrafted rules, for example, if you wanted to tell a cat from a dog, instead of creating these sets of rules that cats have pointy ears and have whiskers and like eating fish, whereas dogs like to bark, we take a completely different approach. We design statistical models that ingest a lot of examples. We're talking millions of images. So the system will take tens of thousands of images of cats, tens of thousands of images of dogs, and through a training process, it learns to develop an internal representation that allows the deep learning model to tell apart a cat from a dog. And these internal representations are represented in, this is like a graphical model, um, of a deep learning model. And so you put in your tens of thousands of images, and then in the output layer, you get the answer of whether it thinks that it's a cat or a dog. And it's through these breakthroughs that we uh, have some really, really exciting new commercial products. So right here in my hand, I have uh, an Amazon Echo Dot, which is right now the best-selling voice-enabled AI speaker uh, in the United States. Let's have a little play around with it. Alexa, play music from my Spotify account. Resuming Spotify. Alexa, stop music. Alexa, can you play traditional music from the country Thailand? I couldn't find any traditional country Thailand songs. <coughs> Alexa, est-ce qu'il y a des bons restaurants à côté d'ici? Sorry, I'm not sure. Vous ne parlez pas français. <laughs> Alexa, dans ce pays, il y a des choses qui sont très bonnes. I couldn't find any enabled video skills. Go to the music video and book section of the Alexa app. Yeah. Enable the video provider you want, then link your Alexa, stop. <laughs> yeah, book you short your way. Alexa, how many are I get my? Sorry, I'm not sure. 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 Sorry, I'm not
Sorry, I don't know that one. <laughs> I mean, I, let's try one more just for good measure. Alexa. <laughs> yeah, wasn't expecting it to get north of Thai either. All right, so this brings us really nicely into the question that we want to be talking about, which, what does it mean to be global citizens in the age of artificial intelligence? What does it mean when the AI assistance that will permeate our homes and our culture and our um, everyday living, for example, are, is unable to understand French and Mandarin, let alone, you know, Northern Thai? And to really hammer this point home, let me show you some of the other worrying things that surface once you probe into how some of these deep learning models work. If we take some of the state-of-the-art natural language processing deep learning models and we had it complete the sentences using a process known as word embeddings, the following sentence is completed in the following way. Man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, why is this so? Well, to, to understand why this is the case, we have to think about how the current generation of AI systems are trained. They are trained on large amounts of data. In this case, it's trained on Wikipedia articles, Twitter feeds, anything that it can find on the internet. And so what this means is that these gender biases that exist in content that humans have created and put onto the internet is automatically absorbed into the deep learning models. Computer vision algorithms are 68% more likely to associate women with cooking. Again, why is that so? It's because if you actually search online and look at the distribution of images that are found on the internet, the data that is used to train these computer vision AI models, we find that there is statistically more images of women in household images than there are men. And for this reason, the AI system, which is really good at finding patterns, finds that there is a statistical pattern between female and household, uh, household images. So what does it mean for us to be teaching our students about, for example, gender equality, when the AI systems that permeate our, our uh, communications, the AI systems that will regulate how information is stored, how information is acquired and disseminated, contain these biases for society? Let me give you another example. Um, algorithms that are used, for example, in judicial systems are more likely to place high risk on African, of people who have uh, of African American descent more than people who are white skinned. Again, why is this the case? It's because if you look at um, incarceration data from the United States, incarceration data is significantly more biased to African Americans, which is a reflection of the systemic problems in American society and criminal law. And these all these social biases that exist in human culture and human society are picked up by these AI systems and propagated further. The scariest thing is that these things operate without us knowing. Technology, when it has these biases, actually operates like a silent hand. If the government, for example, decides to remove the history of a particular ethnic group from a textbook, that's in your face. When an algorithm that is contained in something like Amazon Alexa, propagates these gender and racial biases, it's something that we don't know about it. And it's very, very hard to see the silent hand in action. So current generation AI systems perform extremely poorly under some of the values of global citizenship that some of the senior delegates put up on um, the screen earlier today. In fact, if Amazon Alexa here was a student at Banco Padana, I'm very sure that Alexa would be promptly sent to Jackie Houghton's office, and you know you're in deep trouble when you're sent to Jackie Houghton's office. So, why is this something that we have to be wary about? Well, it's because artificial intelligence is the new electricity, in the words of Andrew, um, the chief, former chief scientist at Baidu. All the changes that will be happening in the ways we communicate, in the ways that we access information, medical diagnosis, the way that our cars are going to drive themselves, is all going to be powered by artificial intelligence. In fact, all of the major technology companies from Google to Facebook to Microsoft to Amazon and Apple have all made AI their first priority and have changed their entire mission statement to be an AI first mission statement. To give you a sense of how fast this change will be coming, let me remind you that exactly 10 years ago, in 2007, 
the first iPhone was released. And prior to that, we were using phones that kind of looked something like that. Between 2007 and 2017, our technology landscape completely changed to a touch-enabled world. And touchscreens have now become the norm in which we interact with computing and technology. In addition to that, the iPhone triggered what is now called the mobile-first economy. We live in an economy where we can buy, we can, we can buy items, get a cab ride all from our phones, access, store, and disseminate information from the palm of our hands. Let's fast forward to 2027. We will now be living in what's called an ubiquitous voice-controlled technological landscape. The next frontier of computing after the touchscreen is being able to talk using natural language to your computers. And I assure you that by 2027, your espresso machine, you'll be making your morning coffee by just talking to it and never having to touch a button ever again. But most importantly, by 2027, 2027, we'll have transitioned completely to an AI-first economy. And so you might be asking, well, what do we do? So, very luckily, something that I've learned from being in this field is that many of the concerns that I have, that I've shown you through my journey from chopping coconuts all the way to musical robots, all the way to making musical instruments, is that many of the prominent research scientists in the field of AI, many of the prominent um, academic and industry institutions are very, very aware of this problem. And it is an issue that is debated and researched very, very heavily in the field of artificial intelligence. For example, the Obama administration last year, in October 2016, last year, released a 60-page document on how to prepare for the future of artificial intelligence. And the committee put together a series of recommendations for both industry and also academic institutions. And if you look at recommendation number 14, it calls for the appropriate increase in the diversity of the workforce in AI specialists, researchers, and users, an increase in the diversity of people revolving around AI. DeepMind, the company that was uh, behind the deep learning model that was able to defeat the world champion at Go, has recently launched an ethics society um, to look into the implications that deep learning and artificial intelligence systems have, especially in cases uh, that we looked at before, such as the one on criminal justice. And you have organizations like AI for All, which was founded by Fei Fei Li, one of the <coughs> prominent computer vision uh, researchers, that aim to address the biases that AI systems have, but really try to involve youth and young scientists who are growing up in the age of artificial intelligence to learn about AI and do research and ch make sure that the progression of AI doesn't fall into one where these biases are propagated without us knowing. And so, this direction that we're taking in technology, calling for this increased diversity of the workforce, calling for the inclusion of multiple viewpoints into artificial intelligence systems, really reminded me of some of the things that all of you have been looking at in education about global citizenship. And as I was, as I was preparing for um, this particular keynote, James Penstone uh, sent me these wonderful slides um, from an intercultural educator called Dr. Asim, where he differentiates between these three levels of cultural integration. At the very top, you have multicultural, which means that there is a coexistence of different cultures, but they're just coexisting. There's limited adaptation, and there's limited communication between these cultures. The next stage of integration is something that he calls intercultural, where there are two-way exchanges, but each of the cultures still remain distinct. The last one, transcultural technologies, is transcultural is the one that I had a lot of resonance with because it seemed to embody everything that I had felt in my own research, in my own experience in the United States, back here to Thailand, to the rest of Southeast Asia, and beyond. And transcultural challenges the notion of boundaries between these cultures and thinks of them to be in a state of flux, constantly and fluidly interchanging with one another. And so with that in mind, I think that the way that we should be designing technologies, the way that we should be looking into the future, is to design technologies that are not only culture aware or enable cross-cultural fluidity, but to really be designing transcultural technologies.
And with that, um, in the workshop that I'll be giving, um, I'll be giving a little bit of an AI workshop, absolutely no coding required. Um, so what we'll be doing is using some open source web-based demos to get some hands-on experience on how some of these AI systems work, and using that as a launch pad to discuss about how we can make the younger generation and students who are learning about global citizenship be aware of some of these biases. For example, maybe in something like Theory of Knowledge, TOK, where we teach students to pick up an article, but to look at the bias of maybe the writer who wrote it and the economic and historical context in which they wrote it to cause them to have a particular viewpoint. I think that there should be the equivalent of that for AI systems, where we teach students to be very, very critical and to question exactly how the algorithms that will increasingly determine um, the world in which we live in, whether it's through a little AI system like that speaker, or even systems using criminal justice, all the way to the cars that will be driving themselves on highways, getting students to think critically and also being data literate. Um, and that is my vision on transcultural technologies. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. admiration for, for, for what you've talked about this morning. Um, absolutely amazing. It's really made me think, and I'm going to have to go away and think about some of those things you've talked about um, a lot more, and I'm sure everybody else will as well. So can we have another round of applause for that?